Welcome back to this series about Webpack. In the previous videos, we learned what Webpack is and how to set up the development server. Now I want to dive into the core concepts behind Webpack, super important to understand. We have four core concepts when using Webpack or on which Webpack builds up on, you could say. Webpack always needs an entry point. Where should it start looking for dependencies? And that can be multiple entry points as you will learn, but it needs to have some entry point, some clue on where it should start its journey. It also needs to have an output and we use both entry and output here in our very basic usage. Where should it store the bundle or if you have multiple entry points, the bundles, then it will create multiple bundles, one for each entry point. And then you have two other things we don't see here, which you will see in this video here though. We have modules, we have loaders, which allow us to transform our code. And we have plugins, which do kind of the same, but on a different, different level. And you will understand the difference in this video. Let's get started by creating a config file. Thus far, we ran all our Webpack commands directly in the command line, and it was fine until now, but for a more detailed configuration, we need a config file. We added in the root folder, the webpack.config.js file, and you can name it anything you like. You will then have to specify the name of your config file in the command line though, or you use exactly this file name and Webpack will pick it up automatically. So if you add it, this file needs to have a certain structure. It needs to export a JavaScript object which holds the Webpack configuration. And you use the Node.js export syntax for this. So you define a module and then use the exports keyword, which you assign a JavaScript object, the configuration object, as a value. Now this JavaScript object has some basic things it needs to contain. First of all, we need to have an entry. Where should we start the journey? And as I said, the entry here can have multiple formats. It could be an array of multiple entry points. It can be a JavaScript object where you map aliases to different entry points. Or here to start simple, you simply reference one single file as a string though. So here you could say dot slash source slash JavaScript slash app.js is my entry point here. The same path as we used here in the package.json file. And of course, this path specified here in the config file has to be seen relative from the config file, from the root of your project. So now we tell Webpack where to start. We now need to tell it where to finish, what to produce. So we next add the output here. Output is a JavaScript object where we configure what the output should look like. Here again, we do have different levels of detail. The most basic form of defining the output is to tell Webpack where to store it and then what to name it. So we can add the path property here. And these property names here, of course, are all kind of reserved. These are names Webpack will recognize. And to make super clear that Webpack, it identifies this correctly, we can use a node.js feature. We can import the path package with required path. This is available since you installed Node.js on your machine and the path package, a core Node.js package, simply gives you some utility functions which help you resolve the correct path. So here you can now call the resolve method on this path package. And as a first parameter, you can pass underscore underscore dir name. That is a reserved variable name. You didn't define it anywhere, right? But it is available. It is made available to you, which simply indicates, hey, the current directory. And then the second argument is the subdirectory you want to go to, like this, a folder which should get created. We don't have it yet. And now why do we use this path resolve method? Because the output path needs to be an absolute path. So, we can't define it like in the entry property where we have a relative path seen from our Webpack config file on. Here, we really need to have a, an absolute path because Webpack needs to write something there. It needs to create a file for us there. And the path resolve method resolves such an absolute path, gives us an absolute path with the given inputs. So that is where to store it. Now we also need to define the file name. So how should Webpack name this file it creates? 
And oftentimes you'll see bundle.js here, though you're not limited to that name, you can use any name you like, of course, but bundle.js clearly indicates that your code got bundled, which is why it is a popular name. So these are the two basic features we already used. Now, before going into loaders and modules and plugins, let me adjust our scripts. I will remove entry and output file name here on the Webpack dev server and do the same for the Webpack command. I will leave the dash p here though. So now let's test both. Let's run npm run build prod first and see if that still works. Looks good. It still created the this bundle JS file. Now I'm going to delete this file and I'll run npm run build our development server. Also seems to work. If we now revisit our web page and reload it, well, somehow we now get an error here. That is something we'll have to look into. But our main script, the production script is working. So it seems to have picked up where to get the files and the Webpack dev server kind of seems to have picked it up, but, but not entirely. There is something wrong with it. Why doesn't our development server not like this setup? Well, before where we pass the full file name with output file name, remember that there, if I temporarily revert this, we specified the full path. Well, now in our config file, we split this up into a separate path and file name declaration. So now the Webpack development server will only look for the file name and somehow ignore the path here. So to tell the Webpack development server where this lives, we have to add another property to our output here, the public path, which basically specifies, well, where are the assets to be found at? And by default, this is just slash, but this is not correct because we know it will be in the dist folder and it doesn't pick this up automatically. So we simply add dist here slash dist. And if we now restart the Webpack dev server, and reload our project, you see the error message is gone. And if I click the button, it works again. So now we fix this too. Now the output is finished and both our normal Webpack uh, command as well as the dev server like it. That's entry and output. And again, you can go into more detail here. We will see more uh, configurations throughout the series, but let's first dive into the next core feature, modules and loaders. That is one feature area. What is that? Modules and loaders allow us to transform our files. And a good example would be our CSS files, which we haven't used right now. We still import them the conventional way here in our index.html file. Now you could say it would be nice if you could for one import the CSS file into the JavaScript file, which sounds really weird. But keep in mind, it's only about informing Webpack that we want to import this file. We're not really mixing it with JavaScript. We only want to make sure that it also gets loaded by Webpack. So that would be one thing. And the second interesting thing would be to then, well, when Webpack has this information that it should load these files, well, it can't add CSS to our JavaScript code. So it would be nice if it could simply output it for us in the head section of our index.html file here. And for that, we need loaders. We need modules which do that transformation for us, which enable us to load CSS and JavaScript and which then automatically add it to the index.html file. Now to get such loaders, I will quit, quit this process with control C and then with npm install, we can install them. Now, there are loads of modules and loaders you can use in Webpack. And you can simply Google for the feature you're looking for, TypeScript compilation, ES6 compilation plus Webpack, and you should find the appropriate loader. For the CSS use case here, what we need is we need the CSS loader and the style loader. These are also development dependencies, so let's mark them as such. And now they will get downloaded and added to our project. You can see it now in the package.json file here. And now we can add them to our config and we have to tell Webpack, please take these loaders into account when analyzing our files. Now, this is super easy to do. We have to add a module property here, which is a JavaScript object. 
And here you can simply configure how Webpack should treat your modules. Now, what is a module? A module basically is every import you have. Like here, the downloader file here, these two variables, these are modules because we export them and we import them here. And our CSS files also could be modules if we want to import them. So it would be nice if in our app.js file, let's say right at the start, we could write import, go up one folder, CSS, and then main.css. That would be awesome. And thereafter, we also want to import the input element CSS file. And of course, you could even add more loaders which allow you to write SAS code and nest your CSS code in each other and much more. But it would be nice if you could use this basic syntax to begin with. And with that added, now these two are all the modules. So that is what we configure here. And now, first of all, we want to set up the rules for these modules. So how should they be treated? Rules is an array of rules, you guessed it. And each rule simply is a JavaScript object. Now, each rule has a certain structure. There are some properties you can set up, but some properties you will need to set up. For example, the test property, which means how does Webpack know if this, rules, if this rule here, the specific rule, applies? It tests the file extension because you probably have the same rules for the same files. So, for example, if we, and this is a regular expression here, if we have a JavaScript file, and the regular expression for this is backslash dot js dollar to indicate it's any file name, but it should end with JavaScript. If we have a JavaScript file, then we want to apply a certain loader. That's the next property we add here. We tested something. Now we add loader. Now the loader for the JavaScript file here is no loader because we don't transform our JavaScript code as of now. So we probably don't need a rule for JavaScript, but one for CSS files. So let's change the extension to CSS. And here I actually want to apply more than one loader. Now loader would simply take the loader as a name like CSS loader, but that would only enable us to add the CSS code to, to import it in JavaScript. Now, if we run it like this, let's run our build script, the Webpack dev server. You see that this works, but if I reload it here, you see that this works. But if I now go to the index.html file and comment out these two conventional imports here, and I now rerun the server and load my file again, you see all the styles are gone because we didn't get an error. So somehow it was able to handle our import statements here, but it also didn't add these styles. And of course it can't because it can't add them to the JavaScript file. So we need another loader to now use the styles Webpack is aware of and add them to the index.html file. This is why one loader alone won't do here. Instead, we won't use loader like this. We will use the use property, which allows us to simply add multiple loaders. Here we add an array therefore, and now we specify all the loaders we want to use. And additionally, you can also specify options here, but that is something more advanced. Let's stick to loaders now. Important is the order here. You could think that you start with the loader you want to apply first, CSS loader, and then the other one, style loader, which is responsible for taking the CSS code and adding it to the DOM, to your head section to be precise. If we run build now, you see we get an error. The reason for this is, that it's not able to handle these CSS imports. It's the same error you would get if you comment out all that module part and run it right now. Like it's not able to handle these imports in the app.js file. Instead, what we should do here is we should reverse the order here. So first load the style loader, then CSS, because and that's super important. Actually, Webpack will execute your loaders in reverse order. So the last element in this array gets loaded or gets, gets applied, you could say, first. So it will first use the CSS loader, which is the loader we need to make it understand these imports, and then it will add the style loader. So now with this setup, if I now run this command, you see now it's working fine. And if we go back to our running web page, you see now I can reload it 
and I do see a working setup again with the code working or the, the styling working the way it should work. This is how you add loaders and how you configure how Webpack should treat your modules. One of the core features and super important and one of the main reasons why Webpack is so popular because there are loaders for all kinds of things. Compiling TypeScript, ES6 code, SAS, SCSS, much much more. Simply google around a bit and you will find a lot of use cases. Now let's dive into the last core feature. Plugins. What are plugins? Plugins are almost the same as loaders you could say and then again they are really different. Loaders are applied on a per file basis. So here we check for CSS files and then on every CSS file we use we apply these loaders to transform the code or load it correctly. A plugin is then applied on your bundle before it is output you could say. So if you have some transformation you want to apply to your whole code, a plugin is what you're looking for. And a typical plugin you would use is the minification plugin. Now of course we already can minify by adding dash p here and that uses this plugin indeed behind the scenes. But if you want to really configure this specific plugin in all detail possible or add another plugin, you will need to add the plugins array here because you can add multiple plugins obviously. Now which plugin can we use here? I will go with that minification plugin. So I will simply need to import webpack for this. So with the required syntax here from webpack and any plugins array here, I can now simply add new, new keyword is important. We need to instantiate it. Webpack, whoops, not like a methodless though, optimize. So call optimize here and then the uglify.js plugin. Here you can pass options in a JavaScript object and this is why this might be preferable to executing it with dash p. You can now dive deeper into this and simply google this plugin if you want to know all these options you have. For example we could disable warnings, we could turn mangling on or off which is a more aggressive form of minification and so on. Here I won't pass any but of course you could do that. If I now restart my webpack development server we should see a difference though. If we reload the page it still does work but now if we inspect the source code you see it's minified here too and it wasn't before when we used the development server. You can also see it on the network if you reload this you see that the bundle now shrank before it was around 300-ish kilobytes now it's smaller because we minified it. So this is how we can add plugins, the fourth and last of the core features of Webpack. So that is our finished configuration file now and that were the four core concepts of Webpack. The entry point, where to start, the output, where to end, what to create and in between during this journey we also have modules and what you do with them and module rules. So what should you do with each individual file you load. And then we have plugins right before we create that bundle. What should you do with the prepared code, with the overall code? Should you minify it? Should you do something else with it? For example, there are plugins which allow you to outsource your CSS code into separate style sheets, things like these. These are the core concepts. That is how Webpack works. And in the next videos of this series, we're going to have a closer look at some default use cases. What to do with Webpack using different loaders, some common setups and things like these. Also write into the comment section what you would like to see. I can't promise that I will cover it all, but definitely interesting to read that and I'll do my best to show some of the things you request there. So see you in the other videos. Bye.